Uh, we thought it would be fun to spend a few minutes, just a few minutes, um, Brian Green and I ta having a little conversation about, mostly about the science behind what was uh, happening in, in his life and all these moments. The world, here's Brian Green. Come, come on, Brian. Here, let's, let's bring our chairs a little closer together. The, the interesting thing to me was he was searching all through his life for simplicity. He couldn't have had a more chaotic personal life. <laughs> and he was looking for things to pull together in the universe. And I, and you, I mean, you could, you, I guess you could do armchair psychoanalysis and say he, he needed to find that because he couldn't find it in life. But what was the what was the unified field theory he was working on? And then the, the, the formula at the end, or the, the n numbers and, and, and symbols that, that we saw on the screen, literally was what he wrote in a notebook just before he fell asleep for the last time. He was writing, trying to figure out a theory that would unify all the forces that he was aware of right up until the last minute. What, what, what is a unified field theory? Well, I, I think you described it really well. I mean, the goal of physics, the goal of science, is to find the deep patterns in nature. And the deepest of patterns, you imagine, will be able to describe the broadest spectrum of phenomenon. So he desperately wanted to find a single framework that would put gravity, the force of gravity that he understood well from the general theory of relativity, he wanted to meld that with the other force that he was well aware of, which was the electromagnetic force. So the goal was to put those two forces together and show that they're basically the same thing described by the same mathematical structure. So at that time, were they the two forces that he was aware of, gravity and the electromagnetic? So that means gravity and and light and all the other That's things. right, electricity, magnetism, light, gravity, wanted to put it all together. Now, the thing is, even at that time, he didn't pay that much attention to it. It was known, it was becoming known that there are other forces. So there's the nuclear force, the right. strong nuclear force that what, holds what, atoms did, together. That, some of that happened during his lifetime, yeah, right? Yeah. Did that bother him? Did he think, oh, I got more forces I have to put together? <laughs> You would think so, uh, but um, <laughs> but no. But you know, I, I think the general belief, and we'd have to like check with Walter Isaacson's book, right? But I think the general belief is he didn't pay that much attention to these other forces. I mean, you can even go further. The, the thing that he was really leaving out in a deep sense was quantum physics, quantum mechanics. Even though he wrote the first paper on quantum mechanics, so one of those 1905 papers was on the photoelectric effect. That's the paper for which he won the Nobel Prize, not the relativity papers. And that's the paper that ultimately yields quantum mechanics, but sort of like giving birth to an unruly child. You don't like how they grow up. He got completely uh, uh, turned off by quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics he viewed as the wrong way of describing nature. And he thought the unified theory would do an end run around quantum mechanics. So all this stuff that he didn't like, he would say that was just a temporary resting place. The unified theory would make quantum mechanics unnecessary. How did quantum mechanics come out of the, uh, the photoelectric effect? What is the photoelectric effect? Yeah, so the photoelectric effect is the recognition that light itself, which had been described as a wave from the time of Maxwell, an electromagnetic wave, could actually be described in terms of little tiny particles. That light was actually made up of what we call quanta, photons. And that move, recognizing this deep relationship between a wave-like phenomenon and a particle-like phenomenon, ultimately by the mid-20s and by the 30s, gives rise to quantum mechanics. So did he, quantum mechanics, as I understand it, sort of acknowledges that it's that, uh, light and other electromagnetic waves are both waves and particles? Probably. Because <laughs> uh, probably is the language of quantum yeah, mechanics. Yeah, that, that, that is what it is. So, um, so quantum mechanics basically shows that whereas Newton and everybody before quantum physics, including Einstein, said what physics is about is 
Tell me how things are now, and I'll use my equations to predict how they will be in five minutes or an hour from now. Because if they're here now, then they'll do things, and that'll happen, and, this, and then you can know exactly where it'll be later. That's right, and quantum mechanics comes along and says that's the wrong way of thinking about things. It says the best you can ever do in any experiment is predict the probability, the likelihood of getting one outcome or another. You cannot say the electron will be here in five minutes. You can say there's a 42% chance it will be there and a 36% chance it will be over there and so on. And that's the best you can do. And this way of thinking about nature, even though it was borne out by experiment, just didn't sit well with Einstein. Well, he didn't actually talk about probabilities, did he? And, and, and oh, yeah. He did? No, he, he knew. So he really kicked off quantum mechanics. Well, he had to embrace quantum mechanics because it was doing such a fantastic job of explaining data. But he basically wanted to take a sledgehammer to it and smash it to pieces. And by 1935, one of his other important papers was basically trying to prove mathematically that quantum mechanics could not be the full story because it predicted such things that couldn't possibly be true to any rational thinking person. Like what? Like what you do over here having an effect on something over there, quantum entanglement. But by 1980, certainly by today, we know that entanglement is real. So this crazy feature of quantum mechanics that he tried to use against the theory itself is actually borne out by data today. And that from, the, from that last paragraph you just spoke came those, <laughs> those two famous sayings of his about entanglement. He said uh, um, that spooky action at a distance. Spooky, he used the word spooky. Yes. Wonder what the German word for spooky is. <laughs> <laughs> so the other one of that his objection, his objection to quantum uh, mechanics being uh, that God doesn't play dice with the universe. Yes, and that's the probabilistic oh, side of things. But th that if, if, you, if everything is a probability and nothing is that definite, then it really goes against the idea that things can be set and solid. Why did he stick to that? Was it, was it he was stuck in an old paradigm? Was it emotional? Was it philosophical? Why couldn't he go where the numbers led him? Well, I, I think he was a revolutionary in some ways. And in other ways, he wasn't. In other ways, he was really very tied to a philosophical perspective on reality. And he had achieved great things as a young man. I mean, think about it. He just sat there with his pen and his paper and had worked out space and time and special relativity. He had worked out gravity and general relativity. This kind of achievement just reinforced that that was the way to understand nature, this completely classical perspective with no quantum mechanics in sight. Then all of a sudden these other people come along and say that's the wrong way of thinking about nature. That's a tough thing to take well, on. By to that time on. he was tired. <laughs> I, you know, I wouldn't say so. No? He, I wouldn't say that he was tired. He was just so married to a particular perspective on the world, and it was an unshakable belief in the coherence of a classical perspective. And I think that was something he just could not give up. It's interesting when you talk about how he was sitting there doing it with a pencil and paper and his imagination. Again, that, that, that other saying that's often attributed to him, that imagination is more important than knowledge. It's hard to believe that he would say that, except he accomplished so much with his imagination based on the knowledge he had. And in, in the piece tonight, he, he talks about that moment when he imagined a man falling off a building. Happiest thought of his life. Happiest thought of his life. <laughs> why, why was that the happiest thought? Because that sounds like he's saying it's the most central image to all his thinking. Yeah, that was the key idea that propelled him toward the general theory of relativity. See, gravity is a, is a difficult subject. It's hard to even figure out a way in to a description of the force of gravity at the level that Einstein was searching for. What he realized was that a certain kind of motion, freely falling motion, in essence counteracts gravity, can eliminate gravity, which means in any situation where there's gravity, if you don't want to have to deal with it directly, 
just execute a certain kind of motion, jump out a window, and then gravity goes away. What? <laughs> you jump out the window, gravity makes a quick entrance. Actually, it, 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 actually it doesn't. It doesn't. So you jump out the window, what actually happens from Einstein's perspective is that the ground is just rushing up and hitting you. You're not being pulled down by gravity from Einstein's perspective. I mean, when Newton was sitting there under the tree, <laughs> yes. according to Einstein, it was not that the apple fell on his head. His head rushed up and hit the apple. <laughs> and that's Einstein's view. Now, I, I can show you this thing. Yeah, yeah I, right, I, right. I, you okay, can, can show you us. Bring, can you bring my little water thingy out there, whoever may be backstage here, here listening comes, to us? <laughs> right, here we go. So, so this idea of, of getting rid of gravity by going into freely falling motion can be illustrated by a little experiment. So I'm, I'm gonna do it because I don't want you to get all wet. So, so what I'm gonna do is, let me describe it first. When I take off this cap, air pressure is gonna be entering into the bottle and water is gonna spew out a few holes that I have here because gravity is gonna pull down on the water. Uh -huh. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let the bottle go into free fall and watch that the water won't spray out any longer. Right, so that's what you should look for. Okay, here we go. All right, right? So here goes the water. Oh, oh, oh sorry about that, right. So um, now watch when I let it go. Holy Did you moly! See that? Right, uh, one more time. Gravity right. goes away! Right, see, there it is. All right? Now, can, that's a great trick. Yeah, it is. Can, can, Einstein, you, right? can you explain why we just saw what we saw? Yeah, so as the bottle is in free fall, it no longer feels the force of gravity, right? I mean, another way of thinking about it that maybe is even you know, more visceral than this little demonstration is, if you are standing on a scale, right? You look down, you see whatever, you know, 150, 160 pounds for me, something like that, right? If I jump out of the window with a scale at my feet and I look down on it, what does the reading go to? It goes to zero, because the scale and me, we are moving together. So in that sense, I'm no longer pushing on the scale. I'm no longer experiencing gravity as I did when I'm standing here on the stage. So if you can counter gravity, if you can cancel it out by going into this motion, Einstein realized the reverse was also true. You could mock up gravity. You could simulate gravity by accelerating too. So that's where you get to a car turning. Exactly. And you, you feel the, mo you, you, you know, it's no longer what you feel in an elevator, which is nothing. Yes. And even though you and the elevator are falling. That's right. If you cut the cable of an elevator, then indeed you and the elevator will fall together just like the water in the bottle fall together, just like the scale and my feet fall together and you don't feel anything. The exact reverse of that is now take an elevator, an empty space, no gravity, empty space and pull up on the cable, making the elevator accelerate in that direction. If you're in that elevator, you will now feel your feet pressing against the floor because the floor is pushing up against you. You will have simulated gravity. Why is that important? Einstein understands motion really well, but he doesn't understand gravity. Now he has reduced gravity to motion, accelerated motion. That gives him a way in, and it does take him a good eight years to fill in all the details, but that yields the general theory of relativity. But you just said Einstein didn't understand gravity very well. He didn't in 1907. 1915, he takes this idea and parlays it into a single equation that describes the force of gravity in a way that had never been achieved. So 1915 was different from 1905 because in 1905, he had a very special sense of what gravitation was. No, he ignored gravity, 1905. Oh, well, that was just relativity, special relativity. That's, special right, that's relativity. right. He only took into account motion that was not speeding up, not right. slowing down, no accelerated motion. Right. When he includes accelerated motion, all of a sudden gravity comes into the story for free in the manner that we're just describing. Because accelerated motion makes gravity. It makes it all of a sudden appear, even though it wasn't there necessarily to begin with. And that's the window into the general theory of relativity. Okay. Okay, the quiz. <laughs> Can you stop?
You have been a wonderful audience, and it's been really fun to be with you tonight and share this evening. And thanks so much Thank you. to Brian for how smart he is.